Well, they're the bullies of the internet, but have trolls evolved into something more sinister, with the power to influence, even control, the outcome of elections? This is Roundtable with me, Matthew Moore. It's been called the great equaliser. The internet is a place for all voices and views. Only some voices are louder and more aggressive than others. They can sometimes bully their victims into silence and affect their lives. But do trolls have the ability to affect a far greater population, have a much bigger impact, swaying public opinion, tarnishing reputations and even manipulating the way we vote? Around two and a half billion people use social media. The interactive nature of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube allows users to say whatever they want to whomever they want under a cloak of anonymity. But some people have been accused of taking this freedom of expression too far. Known as internet trolls, they scour the web looking for victims to offend and abuse. They normally throw out a bait and someone who responds to that bait is considered fair game. With some targeted trolling amassing a large online following. Just how influential have trolls become? Status updates, news feeds, comment chains and political advocacy. Within the past decade, our online social network has become an influential part of staying relevant in the modern world. But this digital communication has a dark side, a staggering growth in online antisocial behaviour. That cloak of anonymity allows someone, through the lack of fear of judgement, to um, express parts of the personality that they might typically not do in company. Nobody is off limits. Actors, musicians, politicians, all victims of online hate campaigns, pranks, memes, harassment, even violent threats. Some trolling is organised and done on a mass scale to influence and distort. And people spreading hate online are now using the internet to organise hatred on the streets. But is posting an opinion online simply freedom of expression? The recent increase in the prosecution of trolls has raised questions about how far online commitment to freedom of expression goes. Silicon Valley has improved its tools for detecting hate almost immediately after it's been posted. Social media companies have long been accused of being too slow to respond. Finding a way to monitor our online social interactions may be necessary, but it could be tough finding a perfect balance between the right to privacy and protecting us from trolls. Well, joining us from Edinburgh is the senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, Ben Nimmo. Ben is researching how Russian media, hacking and trolling work together. He says trolling can be weaponized and used by governments. To my right, Dr. Pam Ramsden. She's a lecturer in psychology at the University of Bradford and says the anonymity of trolling allows people to be less inhibited. On my left, the social media lawyer, Yair Cohen. He has helped celebrities, politicians and others to bring cases against trolls. And we also have Maria Farrell, an internet policy analyst who says what's known as computational propaganda may have played a role in some elections. Uh, Dr. Pam Ramsden, if we could start with you. There are, there are two types of trolling we want to talk about today. Individual trolls and then institutional trolling or governments uh, and other forces using trolling to their advantage. Let's start with the individual. This is probably the, the earliest manifestation of trolling. Uh, what kinds of people like to, to do this online? What I've kind of found is that people with antisocial personality have a tendency to participate in this kind of thing. And I'm not talking about the kinds of serial killer type people, but I'm talking about people who like to participate 
in hurting other people anonymously, mm. and that's what they're doing. And it's the anonymity that, that makes them bolder in their of attacks. Course. Yeah, because there's no, no repercussion from the other person they're attacking. Is Trump a troll? I would say that he is definitely a troll, the way he produces kinds of information about people that are, is very hurtful, mm. calling women no, fat, bad. ugly. Yeah. Now, yeah, Cohen, I mean, you've, you've got many clients, of course, uh, who you need to represent and protect from the trolls. Can you give us an example of the type of hurt that is produced and, and how you defend them? First, uh, I would say that anyone could become a troll. So it is not necessarily the sort of stereotypical uh, uh, image that we have that someone is, uh, I don't know, suffer from low self-esteem or, 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 or anything like that. It could be actually anyone, a businessman, a business owner, a teacher, uh, pretty much anyone and everyone. So. Um, we, we have to get this, this oh, right. So it's expanded then. Oh, uh, uh, it's, it's anybody uh, who's looking to get an advantage or uh, to hurt somebody who, who disagrees with them. Well, well, uh, it is very difficult to uh, analyze the psychology, the, the psychology of, of, of internet trolls. Uh, what we know is that the psychology of the victims of internet trolls is, is, is very, uh, very simple. Uh, we, we, we've had people who, who lost an interest in life. They wanted to commit suicide. Uh, they felt completely lost, they felt defenseless, uh, vulnerable, uh, low self-esteem. Mm. And, and how, how do you help them? Uh, how do you defend them? What we do is we start a process of identifying those trolls. So we obtain all sorts of court orders uh, from all over the world, uh, here in the UK, in the United States, in Canada, whenever it is. We do that very, very quickly. We do it very efficiently, very quietly. And we find ways to identify those trolls. And Maria, how do you identify or define a troll or trolling? Well, I think there are three different kinds of trolling. You know, one level we've got the, indi the individual trolling, so people who are just nasty and, you know, are, are just being antisocial, unpleasant, target people, often women, often people of colour. Um, then at the state end of the spectrum, you have people who are paid by governments to troll political parties, members of the opposition, journalists. And then moving further along, you actually have these automated bots which disseminate information, um, which um, of, often slander people, um, are quite aggressively targeting individuals. So you've got, you've got a whole range of things, and some is just the nasty individual in the stereotypical basement, and some of it is you know, a person at a high level in a government either focusing trolls on foreign states or indeed on their own domestic opposition. Well, you, you brought us neatly there to the government or institutional trolling. Ben Nimmo, uh, you have a lot of experience of, of, of following this uh, with particular uh, emphasis on Russia and the US election. What did you find out there? Well, what, what we saw in the US election was a very high volume of trolling and a lot of bot amplification. So you would, you would typically get what you might think of as the, the shepherd accounts, which would post very aggressive tweets or Facebook posts about their targets. And then you'd get hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of fake accounts amplifying them within the space of a few minutes. And this would really drive the traffic up very, very high. And if they were launching a hashtag, it would make the hashtag trend. But the reason the hashtag trended was not because lots and lots of people were interested in it. It was because one particular person who controlled, let's say, 85,000 fake accounts was getting all those fake accounts to do the same thing at the same time. Is, and that's the classic footprint of bot behaviour. Is that uh, a sort of a troll farm? Is that how you define a troll farm? A, a troll farm is a place where large numbers of people are employed to make nasty posts online. Now, some of them would be employed to make their own posts. They would pretend to be somebody else. They would have a stolen avatar picture. They would try and steal somebody else's identity and then post aggressively like that. Other people would probably be in charge of running the network of bots, which then amplify them. And so you, you, it, in a troll factory, you can think of it as a, as a production chain for large volume online attacks. You have the people who write it and then you have the people who amplify it. Sometimes it'll be the same person, sometimes it'll be different people. We know that in Russia, there's a place referred to as the troll factory in St. Petersburg, where it's known that dozens or hundreds of people are employed to do this. We also know that there are, if you like, amateurs in the US who do this for fun or for conviction or because they like harassing people. And so just by looking at the online behavior, you can't always tell, is this coming from 
the St. Petersburg troll factory? Is this coming from an amateur somewhere in the US or the UK? And that's the hardest part, is actually attributing the attacks. Pam, you are an expert in psychology, you're also uh, from the United States and watch the election very closely. Um, how did these bots and farms it, operated in Russia affect public opinion in the United States? Well, I think the psychology of it is, is any time you believe something negative about someone, then when you read about something, then you're more likely to believe it, additional information that's negative. So I think, unfortunately, with the situation that happened was, is that the more negative information that kept coming out, the more people believe that that's absolutely true. So it, it gained its own momentum, and these opinions, certainly not facts, gained momentum and, and, and took along with it other elements of the population. Correct, because people are watching. That, why are they so gullible? Well, I think what happens is, is that people are always watching things and reading things and they don't necessarily spend the time to inform themselves of what's true or not true. So if I read something and I tell somebody else, then, then that person might believe that what I've done is actually done my research and I understood what was going on and I've told you something that's actually factual and that might not be true at all. And we also see, I think, when we compare what's happening in one country to another, some countries seem to be just more susceptible to this kind of manipulation. So we've seen in the UK with Brexit, in the US with the um, presidential election, there was an awful lot of you know, Twitter activity of tweet farms and the like. And that seems possibly to have helped to swing things, or at least perhaps to increase outcome. But then there are other countries, like Germany, for example, where they just seem to be much less susceptible to manipulation. And you know, I've talked to German friends about this and asked them, what's going on here? Is it because because Russia, which is the most famous perpetrator of this, but by no means the only one, Russia has a very strong interest in what happens in Germany. Why isn't it affecting German politics so much? Why is Angela Merkel on? course to win this election without any trouble and they say well it's partly to do with education better education um, higher social cohesion um, less and, and, and you know a more broad political environment where you haven't spent the last 10 years with austerity and blaming immigrants so we have to look at the broader between the United context. States and Germany I mean, the United States was highly polarized yes at that is. time yeah, it is. And it still is. I think, again, one of the issues that we have is, is that we like to blame immigrants. We have to blame someone for the ills of our country, and they're the likely target. So when somebody starts tweeting about what's happening or degrading a group of people, then, of course, then everybody takes that side and, and agrees. We, we, we've dealt with the, the, the U.S. elections, but you also mentioned Brexit there. Can you expand on that? Do you think that uh, mm -hmm. the farm bots, uh, the farms or the, or the, the bots or whatever, uh, the, they were affecting the outcome of Brexit even? So you have to do some pretty sophisticated research design and methodology to figure out, look, we know there was a lot of you know, bot farms and, and you know, automated um, tweeting going on. And we also know that um, a vast tens, certainly thousands if not tens of thousands of fake Twitter accounts were controlled by about 5% of a very small number of people that were all pro-Brexit. So we know a lot of that activity is going on. What we don't know and what we can't yet prove or perhaps we shouldn't, what we want to remain open-minded about mm. is did this have a material effect on the referendum and on the US election? And I think in the US there's some evidence that swing states like Michigan may have had an impact mm. and in the UK you know, it's possible that it had an impact. I think if you want to find out, you know, what's really going on, you have to look for the smoking gun. And this is who is putting money into these bot farms and where is that money coming from? Uh, ben Nimmo, um, looking for a smoking gun, but there are several guns on the table here, aren't there? I mean, it's happening a lot in China as well. Is that right? Yes, and, and what we're seeing is it's, it's happening more and more in more places. And over the last year alone, we've seen a lot of bot activity in the US. Um, we saw a lot in the UK with Brexit. We saw a lot of attempts to push far-right messaging, particularly in France, before the election there. Uh, we're now tracking attempts by the far-right in Germany to do the same thing, and, and it's very much the same combination of a small number of trolls and a large number of bots amplifying the signal. So it looks like the experience of 2016 has been picked up by a lot of people in a lot of different countries, all of whom seem to have thought, wow, this is the way to have a lot of impact. Now, that said, a lot of the time, if you're seeing a tweet which is, which is let's say, retweeted by 20,000 people, but all those 20,000 accounts are bots and all of their followers are bots, then that tweet's not actually going to have any impact on real people. So one of the ways you can measure the impact is to see whether the message that the bots push 
gets picked up by real people, real politicians, real campaigns. And we certainly saw in the US election, there were occasions where fake stories which had been pushed out by botnets got picked up and then quoted in the campaign. And that's where you see the real impact. Yeah, you're a social media lawyer. Yeah. Well, well I, I, I think the issue is slightly uh, being over-exaggerated uh, here. Uh, what we need to do is we need to look at the uh, voting habits of, say, the over-50s. Now, the over-50s, they tend to use less social media, be less influenced by it. And if the, uh, if the voting habits of the over-50s have been replicated by the general public, by the general population, which seem to be the case uh, both in, in, in the Brexit uh, uh, case and in the recent American election, that tells us that there would have been very, very little influence of uh, automated uh, activities by, by, by social media. Yeah, I think we really, sometimes I think we're, we're looking at social media because it, it's easy to see. It's all out in the open, it's public. It is loud, it right? is there, it's loud, it is it's out there. there, but does it really influence people it's easy as to much measure. as we, we, or some yeah. of us would like yeah. to think? I doubt it. Whereas it, in the US, yeah. one of the things that we did see, which is harder to track and measure, but a real dissemination network for very far right kind of ideas was actually um, by word of mouth and by printed out um, pieces of paper through evangelical churches, right? That's much harder to track. It's much harder to do research on, but it does seem to have had a big impact on how people vote. Speaking of, um, you mentioned the far right there, it seems that uh, a, a lot of this activity we associate with the right or far right, alt right. Uh, is there any uh, political spectrum correlation with trolling or is it, can it be from, from any social group? No, I think it's from any social group. I think, again, I agree with what you were saying in terms of it could be anyone, the grandmother next door, especially with the people who are individually doing it. it, it we found it to be almost anyone. Okay. And it's surprising uh, who, who it, actually is participating in it. it, it from, a, from a legal perspective, when it came to the Russian troll farm that allegedly bought $100,000 worth of, of uh, Facebook ads uh, and were you know, placing false ads there, what can be done to hold Facebook and others to account for this? You follow the money. Uh, as we do in cases of individual trolls, we follow the money. Somebody has got to pay for something. Uh, there would be a credit card, there would be a, 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 some purchase of something going on along the line. And if you follow the money, you will be able ultimately to identify an individual who is behind. Is it, is it illegal to do what they do? To buy uh, adverts and uh, to, to put out uh, fake messages? Well, if, the, if those people who bought those adverts uh, were, were making uh, efforts to conceal their own identity... Well, they were posing could, as, as pro-Trump yeah, America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but then you could be looking at issues of money laundering, you'd be looking at all sorts of other issues that involved uh, individuals or organisations who put money into all sorts of things uh, whilst making uh, a lot of effort to uh, conceal their own identity. But is it illegal? I mean, you, you've dealt with regulation and advising governments. Is it illegal uh, for an entity who knows what to try to influence democracy? Well, in some, in many countries, it, particularly the US, it is illegal to, for foreign um, people from a foreign state or a foreign power to try and um, influence the outcome of an election. So that is a clear breach of law. But I think it's interesting also to follow the money in another way, which is the social media platforms are based on emotions, on clicking through, on keeping people's attention, right? And, you know, some of the algorithms, for um, example, in YouTube, uh, you click on some um, so, uh, uh, video related to politics, it's that you watch it, you're going to get a choice of a few more to watch. Within three or four clicks, you will have found yourself down a rabbit hole of extreme mm -hmm. political views. And that's by design, because the more excited people are, the more upset they are, the this more they so keep true. on clicking. Is that right? right? I mean, so this uh, is Pam, a business you're, you're, model. Yeah. From your psychology Definitely. point of view, that it has to become more extreme in order to, to be heard above the rest of the crowd. It's absolutely true. I think, again, we're looking at social psychology. The research has been done, like, uh, even on, in car accidents. One of the things that people do is they rubberneck, don't they? When, mm -hmm. And what they're looking for is tragedy. You know, they don't want to see that people are okay. So why people like uh, Milo Yiannopoul Yiannopoulos uh, can get uh, viewers, can build up a social media empire because yes. he's so extreme in his uh, views? Yes. And, uh, until he took it down a path so, that, that got too extreme and then people started and, and turning So away. will everyone start to follow that example? Absolutely, So yes. uh, political discourse will become more and more extreme in order to get heard? 
Well, again, I think if you think about what used to happen in social psychology in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, before we had CCTV, where we would go and people would misbehave at a football stadium, it's the same kind of policy. Now the law is holding people accountable because they're on camera, so they're less likely to misbehave. But they can still do that in terms of the Internet because there's anonymity. Yeah. Ben, ben Nimmo, um, when it comes to ordinary... Uh, defamation in newspapers or on the street, for example, you have uh, the law to, to go to and you have a process. What, uh, what is the, how do you regulate trolls with, when they consider that they have anonymity and uh, many other ways of hiding the origins of their comments? There are a couple of things you can do and it depends how aggressive the trolling is and exactly the way the troll is behaving. Uh, for example, two weeks ago, um, a troll created a fake account which pretended to be my boss and then tweeted the fact that I died that morning. Um, so that Looking was very well. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I, mean, I, I can confirm there is Twitter in heaven. Um, so it, it was an attempt to intimidate me and my team. But in that case, it was very easy to get it taken down because the account was an impersonator. It was clearly trying to fool people that it was my boss. And it was a clearly a very aggressive message. So within a couple of hours, we'd reported that to Twitter and it had been taken down. What then happened was that that post was amplified by, we think, about 25,000 bots. Um, but we worked out that they were all reacting to certain keywords. And so we posted a tweet using those keywords copied to Twitter support. All the bots then retweeted that tweet and therefore handed themselves over to Twitter support. And in fact, within 36 hours, Twitter support had taken about 70,000 fake accounts offline based on that tweet. So there are ways that you can report activity, which means that the accounts get taken down. And for example, on Twitter, an there, there are lots of impersonation accounts pretending to be Julian Assange. Normally, they last about two weeks, then they get reported, then they pretend for a couple of days that they're a parody account, and then they get taken off. So with accounts like that, if there's a deliberate impersonation, it's easy to report them. If it's a completely anonymous account with just an alphanumeric name, no, Im no image, then you have to start reporting the individual content. If it's threatening, if it's abusive, you report it as an abusive post. Okay. But that's where it starts getting harder. Let's, let's look at other ways of combating <laughs> uh, trolling. Uh, Pam, how do you uh, put off a troll? How do you get them off your scent? How do you get rid of them? I think for the vast majority of people, uh, the basic thing to do is just get off Twitter for two weeks because then they, what they'll do is they'll find other fresh meat because that's what they're all about really is to create harm. So, um, and, and if you starve them of any They can move on to somebody else. They, they generally move on to someone else unless they're determined to take someone down. In that case, that's, it's very difficult. And then I think you have to go through a legal route but for the vast majority of us, you know, who are just normal, everyday citizens, mm. just getting off Twitter. For yeah, two weeks. yeah. From a, from a legal aspect, how do you best defeat your troll? And 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 does the government have to bring in new legislation to give you those tools? In, in most cases, we we advise our clients to confront uh, the trolls rather than to uh, leave Twitter or leave Facebook or leave. Don't run away. From, but, but but but. but it's it, 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 a long-term long solution, absolutely. Now, in terms of how we deal with it, I think uh, we, we need to do a little bit of thinking as, as a society because we seem to be uh, um, thinking that free speech and anonymity are the same thing, but actually they are not. So what we need to do, uh, or the government needs to do on our behalf, is uh, rethink the issue of anonymity. Uh, I'm not saying that um, people should not be allowed to remain to, to, to tweet anonymously, but what they do need to do is be able to give sufficient information to make it easier for victims of trolling to identify them. So there should be some sort of mandatory uh, arrangement where uh, it is it is easier to go and identify uh, people who abuse other people online. Particularly if it's, it's, if it's more 
than just uh, comments. If they are threats, for example, I mean, you, you have clients, presumably members of parliament, celebrities sure, who have yeah. actually the, received proper the, the, threats. The main reason why these people are getting away with it is because they are taking advantage of, of the idea of anonymity uh, being uh, equalized to free speech. And we need to say to them, no, 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 no. If you want to take advantage of, of free speech, you must uh, make it easy for people to go and challenge uh, your views and be able to identify you. Maria, from a regulatory point of view, how would you advise a government in order to wipe out trolling and help their citizens? See, I see this in two, from two perspectives. I really struggle with this because, on the one hand, I'm a woman and I'm on the internet. And so, and, and I've been blogging on a blog called crookedtimber.org for over 10 years. I've had trolls with me that whole time. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, I've had lots of botnet accounts following me this summer. I mean, I've had death threats, I've had rape threats, I've had the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. And, um, and so, you know, so, so I feel for people who have that at a much greater scale than I have that. Um, Can it be regulated out of existence, just quickly? The problem is, every time you try and do a regulation, it gets used for the wrong purpose. You get rid of anonymity and you've suddenly all the human rights defenders have been kicked off the net as well. If you put, it's like the internet, you create it to do good things, to bring power up from below, to equalise, and actually you end up 10 years later, 20 years later, finding it is the ultimate technology of right-wing state control. Maria Farrell, thank you very much. Yeah, Cohen also. Ben Nimmo and Pam Ramston, thank you all very much for your contributions to the roundtable today. Thank you. Well, there is no simple way to stop trolling. This is clearly going to be an ongoing battle. Perhaps the trolls can never be stopped, but governments, social media companies and we the people have to keep working to contain their malevolent activities. Well, that was Roundtable. I'm Matthew Moore. Thank you for watching as ever.